It is great to be back at Saddleback in this wonderful church that we love so much. See so many lovely, friendly faces this morning. I'm glad to be here. I want to just simply state that the title of the message is, You Won't Believe What I Just Heard. That's the title of the message, and I knew it was a good title because I walked up to my daughter, her name is Jasmine, and I said to Jasmine, I'm vacillating between two titles. The first is Tapping Into the Power of God, or You Won't Believe What I Just Heard. And she said, what? I said, You Won't Believe What I Just Heard. She said, what? I said, that's the title. She said, what? I said, You Won't Believe What I Just Heard. It was like I was watching Abbott and Costello. Who's on first? <laughs> a while back, there was a phone call that came into a local church in the Midwest. The voice at one end of the phone said, I want to speak to the head hog at the trough. And the receptionist said, excuse me, you heard me, I want to speak to the head hog at the trough. And she said, well, if you're talking about our pastor, we don't call him hog, and right now he is unavailable. He said, well, you can call him whenever you want. You just tell that old boy that I got a check for the ministry for $30,000. And the receptionist says, oh, hang on a second. Porky just walked in. <laughs> now, <laughs> I don't know. If that was the greatest news that that church had ever heard, that there was a check coming for 30 grand, I don't know what your best news has ever been, but I want you to think about it. I want you to write it down in, in the bulletin. If you perhaps heard the words yes when you asked your wife to marry, that was the best news you ever heard. Or maybe it was your mother-in-law who says, yes, I approve of you marrying my daughter. That, then that's fine. You put that on there as well. I want you to think about it. What's the best news that you've ever heard? A while back, I began working for a company called More Business Forms. More Business Forms is sort of like Dunder Mifflin of the office. And my regional manager was named Bob Burtwell. Bob is a member here at Saddleback. He's been a faithful member for many, many years. Both he and Sandy have attended here. And Bob was my regional manager. And More and Bob taught me the difference between features and benefits. A feature is a characteristic that makes something unique. A feature sets itself up apart and does something very special. A benefit, however, is how that feature can help you. So during our time together, I want to talk about one of the greatest features in the world. It's called the power of God. We're going to talk about the power of God and the benefits that come as a result of the power of God. Now, how is the power of God manifested in our lives today? We talk about a Jesus who walked around in sandals 2,000 years ago, but how is that made relevant today, that message of power? How is it made relevant in our lives today? Well, Peter is talking. Luke is writing. The book is the... 10th chapter of the book of Acts, and it's verse 38 that gives us a perfect description of what this power is, what it does, and how it is relevant for our lives. It's Jesus' mission statement, and we're going to read it in Acts chapter 10, verses 38. It says, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who are in the power of the devil because God was with him. What a phenomenal mission statement. It's a succinct, perfect way of describing why Jesus came and what he came to do. To go around doing good, healing all who are under the power of the devil. Matter of fact, I like that mission statement so much, I told my wife, you know, when I die, hopefully you'll put on my tombstone, Jason went around and did some good. <laughs> now think about it. how many of you have ever watched the World Cup? Can I see a show of hands? How many of you have ever seen the Super Bowl? Can I see a show of hands? How many of you have ever seen the NBA Finals? Can I see a show of hands? Any of you ever been to a movie theater? Can I see a show of hands? All right. There's something that movie stars, politicians, and athletes all have in common, and that is fame. And I will describe to you what the average fan looks like without using any words, what the average fan looks like when they're watching these major sporting events. <laughs> yeah. 
and some people cry, they laugh, and they're emotionally all over the map. But no one ever writes about these wonderful achievers and philosophers as people who simply go around doing good or healing all who are under the power of the devil. Now, Jesus didn't have any money at the time. He didn't have the greatest fame, obviously. That's why they crucified him. But when Peter talks about him, he talks about someone who just simply went around doing some good healing all who are under the power of the devil. And he did so because God is with him. And that's what the power of God does. It binds up the brokenhearted. It saves the lost. It gives hope to the hopeless. And we're going to look at these four benefits. The first benefit is the benefit of salvation for your spirit. Salvation for your spirit. That is the first benefit. It's very interesting when I say that I come from a crazy family, usually people laugh. How many of you come from a crazy family? Raise your hand. Unless, of course, your family members are here, then you want to keep that hand down. <laughs> I come from a family filled with divorce and alcoholism, lots of dissension. There are nine divorces between all the parents in my life. And so I can tell you that we had no harmony. We had no concept of the concept of salvation or a life walking with Christ was not part of our vocabulary. Very rarely did we ever go to church. And so suddenly I find myself walking in the same destructive patterns as past generations. A Hispanic, a Mexican family specifically, invites me to attend church with them. And I began to go to church with them, but I had yet to cement that relationship with Christ. And I remember walking with one foot in the things of God and one foot on the other side of the fence in the things of the world. And I remember spending one Saturday night with a friend of mine. I was 15, he was 17, and he miraculously got us a six-pack of Schlitz malt liquor. <laughs> and that six-pack wiped both of us out. I woke up in the morning, I was at his place, his parents weren't there. And I remember as I walked into the restroom, I could smell the residue of beer in my hair. If you can imagine, I had hair down to, down to here at that time. And my clothes reeked of beer. And I thought to myself as I looked at me, you are walking in the same destructive patterns as previous generations. And I decided at that moment that I needed a change. I wanted to break the destructive patterns in my life. But the only hope for me was this door we call salvation, the greatest benefit of all. And I realized that when I gave my heart to Christ at that moment, that I did not need to be perfect because perfection is not a prerequisite for salvation. The only prerequisite is a genuine and sincere heart. Many people think that they need to become perfect before they became in a relationship with God. But that couldn't be further from the truth. And that's why the Bible states in Mark 2.17, as Jesus is listening, it says, when he heard them say this, he told them, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners. I want to tell you that if you are here visiting today, and you find yourself in the midst of this large arena or place or wherever you're watching in the midst of a, of a crowd and you don't know who's... Let me tell you something. This church, Saddleback, is made up of people who know that they don't have their act together. And if you are the perfect person and you have your act together and you are all that in a bag of chips, then you may feel a little uncomfortable. People say to me all the time, you know, I don't go to church because that place is full of hypocrites. And I always say, well, come on down. We got room for one more. <laughs> this is a place that I not only endorse, but I send people to Saddleback. And why is that? Because it's made up of a group of people who know that they need God's help. And those are the people that Jesus wants to help, not those who think they got their act together. The Lord rewards our sincerity as we seek him, and he doesn't care about where you come from or your background, and he already knows all the garbage in your closet. And unfortunately, a lot of people think, you know, I shouldn't go to church because I don't have my act together. But the bottom line is, is when you don't have your act together, that's when you really need to start going to church. That voice in the back of your head says, well, you need to make things right before you walk through the door. 
No, that's the opposite way of thinking. That's the opposite way of thinking. The Lord rewards our sincerity as we seek him. He doesn't care about where you come from or your background. The Lord's grace is much like that of an elevator. Now, I've ridden lots of elevators in my life, and I imagine you have too. And I can guarantee you I would bet you, well, not that I would bet you, but if I were to bet you, if we were in Vegas and we were taking odds, maybe it would be $100, I don't know. I bet you you've never stood in front of an elevator and you've asked that elevator when it showed up at your floor, what floor did you come from? No one cares. Where the elevator? I've never had one person say, I don't, I'm not getting this elevator. If it came from the sixth floor, I'm not getting in the elevator. I don't associate with elevators that come from the sixth floor. <laughs> the only thing we care about is if we're going down, the arrow's pointing down. Or if we're going up, the arrow's pointing up. That's the only thing we ask. God already knows where you're coming from. And he doesn't care about your religious background. He doesn't care about how many sins you've committed in your past. The only thing he cares about is the condition of your heart. Where are you going? And he's going to help you get there because the only prerequisite for the Lord is that we have genuine hearts. Now, we've seen a number of immigrants come across the border. 200 years ago, they were coming from the east. Nowadays, they come from the south. And many years ago, we had a family come across, a father, a mother, and nine children. Okay, for me, that is not a family, that is a factory. <laughs> a Mexican factory came across the border and landed in the San Joaquin Valley. And they came looking to establish and to live and to somehow attain the American dream. But what they found was misery, disgrace, and depression. And so the mom did everything she could to somehow survive and to make the family survive during these difficult times and transition in a new country, learning a new language. And the dad, well, he turned to his best friend who happened to be Jack Daniels. So he began to drink, and she was just trying to make the family survive. One day, she's walking down the streets of one of these towns in the San Joaquin Valley, and she sees a tent. She thinks it's a circus tent. She thinks, oh, I'm going to go inside and see a circus. I'm going to see lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. She's going to see trapeze and trampolines and clowns. And when she walks in the door, or through the curtains, I should say, she discovers it is not a circus tent. It's an evangelistic campaign. She sees a musical group. There's a guy who's just about to speak. And so instead of making some kind of scandalous exit, she decides to sit down in the last row and just sort of check things out. She hears the music. The guy gets up. The preacher says, only Jesus can forgive you of your sins. Only Jesus can set the captive free. Give your hearts today, and you'll be free indeed. And tears began to stream down Juana's eyes as she heard the message of hope for the very first time. She got up, and she came down to the front when he gave the invitation and at that moment, she gave her heart to Christ. She went back to the house. Her husband said, where have you been? She said, you won't believe what I just heard. Oh, I walked down the street and I saw a tent. I thought it was a circus tent, but it wasn't a circus tent. No, it was an evangelistic campaign, and I gave my heart to Jesus. And he said, woman, I prohibit you from going back to that tent. If you go back to that tent, I'm going to get my gun. I'm going to shoot that preacher in the head, and I'm going to drag you out by your hair. Do you understand me? Well, being a good Mexican woman, she went back to the tent the next day. <laughs> a couple hours into this thing, the dad asked the kids, where's your mother? He'd had a few drinks. She went back to the tent. He says, I told that woman if she went back to that tent, I was going to get my gun, I was going to shoot the preacher in the head, and I was going to drag her out by her hair. He took another swig of whiskey, put the gun in his jacket, and there he walked, heading to this campaign in this town in San Joaquin. And as he's walking towards the, camp, the, towards the tent, it starts to rain. With each step, it's raining harder and harder and harder. And you know that in the San Joaquin Valley, it doesn't do that very often. So he gets to the tent. It's raining so hard, he doesn't want to make a scandalous exit. So he sits down in the last row. The preacher gets up and he says, only Jesus can forgive you of your sins. Only God can set you free. Give your heart to Christ and you'll be free indeed. And tears began to stream down Felipe's eyes for the very first time. He heard that there was hope. He got up, he came down to the front, and he gave his heart to Christ. And you know, five years later, that family not only became involved in ministry, but they started the very 
first Spanish-speaking church in the San Fernando Valley. And a few years later, his grandson gave his heart to the Lord on the steps of that altar. And today, his grandson, Rich Guerra, is the superintendent of the Southern California District of the Assemblies of God. I can tell you that God's grace impacts generations. It touches many people in every direction of your life. My mom, who drank for many years, 14 years after I gave my heart to the Lord, she gave her heart to the Lord and hasn't had a drink since. I can tell you that the power of God changes generations. The consequences of your decision to fully engage in a relationship with Christ will go on for generations. The consequences of your decision will go on for generations. Which brings us to the second benefit. And the second benefit is peace for your mind. God always wants to give you his peace when you are burdened, when you are stressed and exhausted. That's why Jesus so eloquently said it in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. Then Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. He gives us peace in the midst of the storm. He gives us peace in the midst of the anguish. He gives us peace in the midst of fear, anxiety, and stress. As we look back 2,000 years ago, we see that when the church first began, there were 11 people who were common, simple, common people. 11 apostles. Every one of them had the faith to move mountains, and we would all agree. They raised the dead. They healed the sick. They did the miraculous. There is no dispute about that. But one thing they all have in common was is that they all died believing that Jesus was going to return before their death. That was their paradigm. And we all know that it's a historical and archaeological fact that that did not happen, that he did not come back before their death. You talk about disillusionment. You talk about moments of panic and anxiety as they're facing martyrdom. I'm sure many times they lie awake at night wondering if they got it right. What am I doing with my life? Did I misinterpret something? And yet their counsel to us, if every one of them, if I could parade them up onto this stage right now, they would say, only Christ can give you the peace that passes all understanding. Only Jesus can give you what is missing in your heart. Not all the money in the world, not all the political context, not the best remedy known to man, only Christ can give you the peace that passes all understanding. Some of you here need, desperately, you need God's peace. You lie awake at night wondering how you're going to make ends meet. You're trying to figure out how you're going to solve the issues with your children or maybe your parents. And all the money in the world, you've discovered this perhaps, all the money in the world won't solve some problems. You need God's peace. And I'm guilty. I'm guilty of trying to resolve my problems with my own remedies. But when I lie awake at night, I come to the conclusion that, you know what, when I don't have all the answers... Only Jesus can give the peace that passes all understanding. Christ will guide you through the storms of life. And he will give you peace because he is the prince of peace. He is the prince of peace. Isaiah 9, 6 sums it up this way when talking about Christ. For to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Which brings us to the third benefit, which is healing for your body and your soul. The third benefit of the power of God is it brings healing for your body and your soul. God always has compassion on those who suffer, those who suffer physically and emotionally. The heart of God desires to help and comfort those who are downtrodden. The heart of God always desires to help those who are suffering. It's like those four guys that love their friends so much that they went over to this family's house and they somehow convinced the family 
to lend them their friend that they loved so much who was paralyzed. They put him on a mat and they carried him. We don't know how long the distance was, several miles perhaps, but they got to the house because they had heard that Jesus was there and that Jesus had the power to heal the sick. When they got to this house, however, they discovered that the place was absolutely packed like sardines. And as they looked around the house, there was five, six, seven people deep all around the outer perimeter of the house and not one person would move one inch to allow this guy into the house to have access to Jesus. Not even the religious leaders would move an inch. What a crowd. And so as you know the story, you've read it, these four guys just simply threw in the towel and said, well, we can't do anything, and walked away. No, you know that's not what happened. No, instead, one of them turns to their friend and says, you know, this guy needs a skylight. So they climb up the side of the house. They mark off the exact location where they believe the master is teaching. They walk over, they put an X, and they start ripping up this roof. Jesus is sitting there teaching when all of a sudden dust starts to fall out of the ceiling. He's brushing the dust off of himself, and now hay is falling. And pretty soon the disciples figure it out, and Peter, who's the worst bodyguard in the history known to man, says, Jesus, just give me the word, and I'm going to yank these guys out of here. And the owner, I don't even have to tell you what the owner of the house is thinking. What are these guys doing to my house? The Bible says, when he saw their faith, he said to the young man, your sins are forgiven. Now I can imagine the four of them peeking through the hole in the roof saying, what did he just say? He said his sins are forgiven. Is Jesus blind? Is he blind? Can he see that he's paralyzed? Why is he talking about the forgiveness of sins? Oh, you see, the Lord knew what the guy's problem was, but there was even greater problem in this young man's life. There was a barrier that had fallen that prevented this young man from receiving the healing of God, and that's why Jesus, recognizing when that barrier fell, it had to be removed. The Lord saw a barrier that had to be removed, and before any blessing or healing could come, the man's sin had to be forgiven. And that's why many times we don't receive the breakthrough, because there are things in our life that separate us from God. We cry out, we look for, but we refuse to allow the things in our heart to be revealed or forgiven. And all of a sudden, there's a nice little disturbance that takes place. Just at the moment when Jesus is about to heal this guy, there's a uprising among the religious leaders, the legalistic folk, the Pharisees. The same kind of uprisings handle, or, or happen in almost any church in almost any part of the world today. You have the leadership who believes they have a direction from God, that the gospel message is to bind up the brokenhearted, heal those who are in oppression, give sight to the blind, preach good news to the poor, but they can't because there's a group of real legalistic religious people who are saying, you know, you don't have the right to do that. You know, it's too hot in here. It's too cold in here. The music's too fast. The music's too slow. So-and-so's got an earring. That person's got a mini falda on. All kinds of things that have nothing to do with the gospel message. And so Jesus, in order to somehow silence this crowd, he says, listen, just so that you know that I have the ability to forgive sins, and I have the authority to do so. He turns to the paralyzed guy. I say to you, take up your mat and walk. The guy explodes off the ground. He loads up his mat. He's walking out in front of everyone. The crowd explodes with applause. And meanwhile, there are four individuals who are looking through that hole in the roof who are watching their friend walk for the very first time. The power of God recognizes when there is something in our lives that must be removed. And many times, it's the, or are those sinful things in our hearts that keep us from experiencing God's peace, healing, and the breakthrough that we seek. Many times it's those sinful things in our hearts that prevent us from experiencing the breakthrough. A few months ago, I was just about to walk on the stage speaking at a leadership conference back in Washington, D.C. My wife is with me, and I said to her, I'm about to go on stage I need a story. I'm pacing back and forth. Usually I'm not pacing before I speak. She says, what's wrong? I said, I need a story. She said, well, why don't you tell the favorite story that my dad tells? I said, well, I don't know the favorite story that your dad tells. 
She says, oh, we were missionaries in Paraguay because she's a missionary kid. I'm a bartender's kid. She's a missionary's kid. <laughs> and she said, we were starting a campaign. We had a tent. And every night we pray for people to, to receive Christ. We pray for the sick. We pray for miracles. Because God has to meet these people right where they're at. And this guy would come night after night, week after week. He's been there for six weeks. He's paralyzed. So my dad, being a man of inspiration, a man of encouragement, walks up to him and says, what are you going to do when the Lord heals you? And it's not like, now that you've done this, what are you going to do? I'm going to Disneyland, you know? What, now that the Lord, what are you going to do when the Lord heals you? And the guy says, I'm going to go home. I'm going to get my gun. I'm going to shoot the guy who did this to me. My father-in-law says, well, that's probably why the Lord hasn't healed you. <laughs> Maybe the breakthrough hasn't come because of the stuff in our lives. Maybe it's the condition of our hearts. The Lord knows what we would do if that breakthrough comes. Maybe that's why you haven't won the lottery. Robert Kiyosaki eloquently states it this way. He said, if you are poor and you are an idiot and you suddenly come into a windfall of money, you have now become a rich idiot. <laughs> the condition of the heart is what has to change. So I turned to my wife. I said, well, what happened? She said, I don't know. I go, I'm just about to walk on stage. I got to find out how this story And She says, you're going to have to call him. 30 seconds before I get up on that stage, I called my father-in-law. I said, hey, how's it going? He says, fine. I said, do you remember a story about this? He says, oh, yeah, great story. I said, well, can you tell me how it ends? I'm just about to walk on stage. And by the way, can I use your story? <laughs> he says, yeah. He says, it took me about a week to convince this guy that he had to forgive the guy who had done this to him. And after a week of dealing with this guy and praying through the issues, he finally released it because forgiveness is not an emotion. It's a choice. And when he made the choice to forgive, within a week, he was walking. And after 10 days, he was walking normal. I can tell you that many times it's the bitterness that we harbor. It's like the poison we drink hoping that someone else will die. Now, it could be that God heals you instantaneously. It could be that God delivers you instantaneously. But many times he takes us through a process like Celebrate Recovery, which is a great program. Sometimes it's instantaneous. Sometimes it's through a process. But regardless... We need God's power, his divine intervention to speak healing to our soul and to our lives. God's number one priority is always the condition of our heart, is always the condition of our heart. And the fourth benefit, the fourth benefit which brings good news to so many of us is deliverance from the destructive patterns in your life. The first time I heard the gospel message, the pastor opened up his Bible. He looked out at that crowd, and he said these words. If the Son sets you free, you'll be free indeed. John 8, 36. The Lord heals all who are under the power of the devil because God is with him. So regardless if you struggle with the issues or with these issues such as identity crisis, Vices and addictions, destructive patterns, spiritual torment, spiritual incarceration, abuse, dysfunction, or even fear. The power of God can deliver you from any of these chains, regardless of where they are, regardless of how tied up you are. Now, when you look at me, you see someone who comes to Saddleback and speaks occasionally, and I just want you to know that I do a lot of speaking in churches. I speak occasionally for the Zig Ziglar Corporation, occasionally. Uh, many times we do crusades. A lot of times I'm on the air. But my environment where I feel the most comfortable are in open air evangelistic outreaches in marginalized communities. Marginalized communities filled with gangs, drug traffickers, prostitutes, and people who are hooked on drugs, and poverty run, running rapid. That's where I feel most at home. And usually people are not sitting, they're standing. So for a speaker, it can be rather nerve-wracking to see somebody standing there for two hours. That's where I learned to speak, 
and that's where I feel the most comfortable. And one of the first campaigns we ever held was in a marginalized community called Los Cuadros in Central America. We set up our platform. It was a 45-foot flatbed trailer that had aluminum extensions, so it made a 45 by 24-foot deep stage. And then we had lights, wonderful lighting, an electrical generator, and we had a Bose sound system that was worth probably $50,000 at that time. And everything was portable. So we drove up, we set up everything, we had 10 guards in place, and at six o'clock, I went home. Back in the day, I had to show up, I had to help set up, and I had to afterwards prepare myself to preach. I didn't have a team, so I had to do most of it. So we left 10 guards in place, I went home, I had a bite to eat, I went to bed around 11 o'clock, and at 11.30, the phone rings. It's the wife of the host pastor, and she says, Brother Jason? I said, yes. She said, do you remember your sound system? I said, yes. She said, do you remember the lighting and the electrical plant and all those things that you left up here? Yeah. She said, do you remember the 10 guards that we left taking care of all that stuff? Uh huh. She said, well, they're not there. I said, well, where are they? She said, well, a gang of 25 showed up and they cut off one of the guard's ears and he's in intensive care right now. And right now there's no one because everyone just fled to save their lives. There's no one guarding your crusade gear. We recommend that if you want to have anything left by daybreak that you get on up here and help us while my husband's out looking for replacement guards. He's desperate. He's out looking for anyone with a gun, a dog, a mean cat. He's looking for anyone that can guard that platform, but you got to come while he's out looking for new guards. I said, not a problem. Now, I don't wake up fast. I was asleep. I don't wake up fast. So I immediately put on my Nike shirt, just do it. <laughs> With my Nike shorts, Nike shoes, and my Nike socks. I look like the Nike poster boy. <laughs> Headed to a marginalized community, white guy, Central America, marginalized community. I drive up to this place, I get out, and there's nobody there, thinking, no big deal. I get up on the platform, I'm pacing back and forth, and as I'm pacing back and forth, I say, I may as well make good use of my time, so I start to pray. As I pray, I said, Lord, help me to deliver the message of hope to this community. People who love and who need and who desire, but they have nowhere to go. They have no future, but you have a great future that you can forge for them. Help me to connect the dots for them. Help them to see your love for them. And I turn around the back, and forgive me for turning my back to you, on the back of the platform, there was a sign that read, I esperanza en Jesus, which means there's hope in Jesus. And I thought, you know, that is the theme, and that is the message, that there is hope in Jesus. It doesn't matter who you are. And as I was looking at that sign, I heard sort of a twig snap, like someone had stepped on it, and I turned around, and there was 25 gang members standing in a half-moon circle right off the side of the platform. The leader emerged... And he said, what do you think you're doing? And I said, um, uh, I'm guarding the platform. <laughs> That's what 25 gang members did. They all laughed, just like you did. <laughs> he said, uh, who's Jason Friend? Who's that guy? I said, uh, I don't know. I figure, you know, if Abraham can tell Sarah, tell Pharaoh that I'm your brother. <laughs> and I can tell the guy, I don't know. He said, aren't you afraid to be here dressed like that? <laughs> I said, you know, if the Lord is with me, I have nothing to be concerned about. So far, Saddleback is batting a thousand. Not, the, not in any of the services has anyone even whispered, Amen. <laughs> Most are looking like, mm, I don't know about that. <laughs> Listen, you can find trouble in Springfield, Missouri. And you can find peace in Watts or in the Bronx or in any other place on the face of the planet. If you are with God, then there is nothing you need to be concerned about. That's gospel truth. 
The Lord is with you. I'm not. All of a sudden, I hear the honking, honking of a horn. It's getting louder and louder. And sure enough, the pastor's driving onto the lot. He's in the minivan. He's got 10 new guards and two Doberman Pinchers. And when those two Doberman Pinchers got out of that car, that gang said, whoa, I think that's enough for us tonight. And I said, well, I've been relieved of my post. I'll see you later. And I headed off to my minivan. And the leader shouted out, we'll see you tomorrow night. And they came. And they did not come to worship the Lord. No, no. During the second song, they were hurling these huge concrete rocks that were exploding on top of this aluminum trailer. During the third song, an enemy gang member had a crowbar, and he struck another enemy gang member, and they had literally split his skull in two. A huge brawl broke out five feet from the front of the stage. During the fourth song, there was a guy selling crack cocaine, and he was selling it to an undercover cop, and when he tried to put him under arrest, he resisted. He pulled out the nunchucks and beat this kid into the ground and threw him into the back of the squad car, and I thought, this is the most Pentecostal service I've ever been in my life. <laughs> Then I was given the microphone, now it's time to preach. <laughs> when I began to preach, five individuals walked onto that lot. They had an entrance like none I've ever seen before. I saw pastors and security guards moving out of their way to give these guys passage. They were the most feared organized crime leaders in that entire region, and they came to find that kid with a crowbar. They were going to kill him. They had heard what he had done to one of their gang members. They planted themselves by the base of the light tower, and they began to scan that crowd looking for that kid with the crowbar. I started to preach. I began the message this way. Some of you will be going to hell, and there's nothing you can do about it unless you give your life to Christ. <laughs> Jesus is your one and only opportunity, friend, and you need to get your life right. You have no idea when your last day is going to be, and God is giving you that opportunity. Take advantage of that. And the leader stopped. He turned to his friend. He said, what did that guy just say? He said, you mean that gringo up there speaking on the platform? He says, yeah, what did he just say? He said, we're all going to hell. There's nothing we can do about it. He said, that's what I thought he said. He said, well, we're going to see who's going to hell after this service is over. And they stopped looking for that kid with a crowbar. Start focusing on me. So I didn't move around that much on the platform at that point. Kind of stayed right behind the podium, lots of lights. I gave the altar call, 17 people came forward. You could count them. 17 people came forward. And I look over, the musicians are all, they're all huddled together, you know. Oh God, oh God, don't let them kill Jason. I look over, there's my wife, my daughters, you know, they're praying, oh God, please don't let them kill Jason. And what's the man of God doing? The man of fire, the man of anointing. What am I doing? I'm praying, oh God, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. <laughs> All of a sudden, an usher gets up. By the way, I love ushers. I heard one person clap. So there's one person besides me who likes ushers here. I love ushers. And this usher gets up, walks to the base of that light tower, looks him down the barrel and he says this, you guys have brought drugs into this community and because of the drugs you brought into this community, my brother is dying in the streets. And if you had any sense whatsoever, you'd listen to what this guy is saying, you leave here free, man, you've sought power, you've sought freedom your whole life and you looked in the wrong places. Only Christ can give you what you're needing. He said, you know what this community needs? It doesn't need more drugs, it needs more of the Lord. And I'm gonna pray right now and I want you to join me. And he started to pray. Now Latins only have two volumes when they pray, on and off. And he prayed like Latin's pray. He started, oh God, send your fire, send your fire. And they began to look around for this fire that's gonna. <laughs> After about two or three minutes, he stopped. There's one thing about Hispanics, they are so genuine. He looked at them and he said, notice the pronoun. I believe that if we ask the Lord for forgiveness and we invite him into our heart, that we will leave here free men we can experience the freedom that only Christ can offer. Don't you want to do that tonight? And I'll tell you, I couldn't believe it. I was watching from the platform as I saw one hat after another come off. And they got onto their knees and raised their hands and began to weep before the Lord as they prayed and asked the Lord for forgiveness. Then they got up and they came down to the front. I was in shock. They said, oh, Brother Jason. <laughs> they had boogers coming out. Oh, Brother Jason. <laughs> Oh, we want to ask you for forgiveness because we were going to kill you after the service tonight. <laughs> but now you're 
don't have to worry about that because Jesus set us free. And I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Five days later, the phone rings. It's 11.30 at night. I have no idea why everybody calls me at 11.30 at night. <laughs> Voice on the other end of the phone says, hey, this is Juan. Do you remember me? I was going to kill you after the service the other night. You remember me? I said, I will never forget you for the rest of my life. <laughs> He said, we just got to have a prayer meeting. God is so good. He is transforming our lives. Hang on a second. Carlos wants to talk to you. Carlos gets on the phone. You remember me? I said, I won't forget you either. <laughs> Talked to all five of those guys. And the theme was, God is so good. All of them, all five of them, eventually left their gangs, began to recruit their gang members. Churches began to extend and began to grow in their attendance. And the gang activity has never been the same since that time. The Lord can deliver. The Lord can redeem. The Lord can break any chain no matter what it is. It doesn't matter if you're a lonely housewife suffering with depression or you are a gang member. I've come to tell you this morning and this, this time that God has great things in store for your life. He's got powerful things in store for you. You may be facing the most incredible, the most difficult scenario, but I've come to tell you that Jesus anointed with the Holy Spirit and power, goes around doing good, healing all who are under the power of the devil because God is with him. In your bulletin, you're gonna see on the right-hand side, I wanna encourage you to take that bulletin to snap out the right side of that card and I want you to check that box. If today you need to make a decision, a decision to follow Christ, a decision to begin a new life, Perhaps you do need to join Celebrate Recovery. You've got issues and, and perhaps chains in your life that need to be broken. You have a specific prayer request. You simply want to learn more. Take a step of faith. Don't leave any money on the table today. The power of God is yours for benefits that will change your life. Don't walk away from the offer that God has for you today. He can deliver you. He can give you peace, salvation, and healing. Today could be the beginning of one of the greatest seasons of your life. Father, I pray for my friends, the people that I love and admire so much. And I ask, Lord, today that your salvation would come to their homes, to everywhere that they work, where they go, I pray that you would redeem everyone who desires to be redeemed. For you have not come to simply heal those who are healthy, but those who are sick, those who know that they need you. And I pray today, Lord, that they would make the decision to follow you in Jesus' mighty name. And yes, I do pray for peace, peace that passes all understanding. For there are people here, Lord, that have walked with you for years, but they need peace. They need your peace. And I pray, Lord, that you would speak healing, healing into the souls and into the bodies of those who desperately need your intervention, and you would bring deliverance to everyone who is in bondage. I pray in Jesus' name that you would bless them, that you would prosper them, that you would raise them up, give them favor and give them grace. Be with their children, their children's children for a thousand generations, and may the blessings of God fall upon this place. And I thank you for them. In Jesus' mighty name and all God's people said, amen. Thank you so much. God bless you.